Good morning, Denver Community Church. My name is Maggie Knight, and I am our children's pastor here. It's great to gather together as we explore and participate in the life of Jesus so that we can be a healing presence in our world. As DCC, we believe that each of us is called to be a participant, not an idle passenger in the life of our community. This means that we get to use the unique gifts and resources we have so that we can do the vital work that God has entrusted to the church to be a healing presence in our world. I invite you to open up our DCC app or take a look at the cards in the seat pocket in front of you. There you'll find ways to get connected with community here, support local and international partners, find ways to serve with us on Sunday mornings, and to give financially. You can also visit the back corner of the room and speak with our staff to find out more about how you can be an active participant. Christmas is just around the corner. One of my very favorite gatherings is our incredible celebration to mark the end of Advent. Yes, I am talking about our Christmas Eve gatherings. This year we will have two gatherings at 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. Childcare will be provided for kids ages zero to five who register in advance. We are excited to have you join us for a wonderful evening. Christmas Eve will also be our very last gathering in 2021. As a way of honoring our staff and volunteers, we will not be gathering on December 26th or on January 2nd. That's right, we have back-to-back -back Sundays where no gatherings will be happening in this building. You can show up, but no one will be here to greet you. I'm so sorry. We will have an online virtual gathering on January 2nd, so be sure to join us for that. We hope the end of this year can be a time of reflection and rest so that we can enter the new year refreshed and renewed. We will be back in this building on January 9th. Our staff and volunteers will be extra excited to greet you since we'll have just had two weeks off, but we'll also be excited because we're bringing everyone together for one gathering. Beginning that Sunday, January 9th, we will have one gathering each Sunday at 10 a.m. only. We look forward to honoring our value of building connection and with one another as we come together as one community in one location at one time. Finally, as we move toward the end of this year, we invite you to give a year-end financial gift. I've personally seen the generosity of our faith community positively impact my ministry area, especially the lives of new parents, whether it's providing meals for families with new babies or hosting child dedication class twice a year. We're only able to meet those needs because we have the resources to do so. DCC Kids is a healing presence for new parents because of the generosity of people like you. You can give a gift through our app, on our website, or you can give through cash and check using the envelopes provided uh, and placing those in the silver gift boxes as you leave here today. Thank you for all you do to support all we do in and outside of DCC. We're grateful for all of you and we're glad that you could join us this morning.
We have lit the first two candles the past two weeks, one for hope and one for peace. Today we light the third candle, the candle of joy. We see joy all around us, in the children, the lights, the music, the gathering together. But there are some of us who miss joy because of the busyness of this season, still others who find joy hard to grasp because sorrow is near. So today, may we open ourselves up to joy, trusting that God has already planted it in us. And may we give the joy given to us, to all people. Loving God, we open ourselves to you. Fill us with the kind of joy that cannot be contained, but must be shared. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. God, all kinds of feelings pass through us in this life, from happiness to sorrow and everything in between. We can look around and see all kinds of reasons not to feel joyful until we learn joy is not felt, joy is found. We straighten our spines, posturing ourselves towards joy, needing constant rediscovery until it becomes our nature. Joy in pain, joy in transformation, joy in journeying, joy in growth, joy in parting, joy in waiting. This is the joy that wells up from us, the intentional song, the thoughtful gift, the word of comfort, the broken thing mended, the belly filled. This is the joy given to us, to love and be loved, to sacrifice and be blessed, to be lost and to be found. Amen. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Uh, if you want to follow along with today's reading, uh, we're going to be in the book of Ruth. And we're in the book of Ruth because during Advent, we've been going through Jesus' genealogy that is written about in the Gospel of Matthew, in which Matthew names four women who we find in the Hebrew Scriptures, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. And today we're going to look at Ruth's story, which is a story that unfolds in four acts, or maybe we should say four chapters. And this is how it begins in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. And his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malone and Kilion. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they lived there about ten years, both Malone and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and husband. Now this is a brutal start to his story. It starts with famine. There's no food. And then we're told that these, this family from Bethlehem, which ironically means house of bread, and the, there is no bread, they go to Moab. And Moab for them was like the enemy. It was the worst place to go. It was a place of sin and everything else that you shouldn't go to. And yet that's where they have to go. And this woman, Naomi, goes with her husband, Elimelech, and then her sons, whose names mean sickness and languishing. Imagine that conversation. Mom, why did you name me sickness? Yeah, why did you name me languishing? But this is who they are. And then we find out that Elimelech dies, and then her sons die. So the story right from the start is about refugees going into a foreign country that was hostile, death, famine, it's no wonder at the end of this chapter that Naomi says, don't call me Naomi anymore, which that name means something like pleasant. She says, call me bitter, call me Mara, because God has made my life bitter. On her way back to Bethlehem, when the, the, she hears the famine is done, her two daughters, Orpah and Ruth, come with her, and she says to them, go home, go back. There's nothing left for you in Bethlehem. There's nothing left for you in my family. And we learn that Orpah does, in fact, go back. And by the way, did you know that Oprah Winfrey's real name is Orpah? 
It's just that people began mispronouncing it so much that she just adopted Oprah. It's true. Look it up. You can Google it because there's nothing false on the internet. So Orpah goes back, but Ruth says to Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your gods will be my gods. Your people will be my people. And where you die, there I will be buried. We're not told any reason as to why Orpah goes back or why Ruth stays, but this is where it begins. It begins with a brutal start, death and famine, and it ends with two women going back by themselves to Bethlehem. And then, once they're in Bethlehem, they have to figure out how they're going to survive. And this is where we find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2. It says, now, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up some of the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging, belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, there were laws on the books for the Jewish people about how you were supposed to harvest your fields, how you were supposed to harvest your olive groves and your grapes. And the rule was this. When you are harvesting, don't go all the way to the edge of the field. Leave the edges of the field for the poor and the widow and the immigrant. And if you're harvesting and you accidentally drop some grain, don't go back and pick it up, but leave it there for the poor and the widow and the immigrant. And so this is what we see happening. Ruth and Naomi are both widows, and Ruth is an immigrant. So they have no other way, they have no other means to be, begin getting food other than going to the fields and gleaning or picking up behind those who are harvesting. This is what Ruth is doing. She doesn't know she's in the field of Boaz, but we're told later in the chapter that Boaz shows up and says, who's that woman over there gleaning? And they say, oh, that's Ruth. She's a Moabite. And she came here with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she's promised fidelity to Naomi for the rest of her life so that she can care for her. Boaz is so moved by the actions of Ruth, he says to the men, don't harm her, don't go near her, and then goes to Ruth and says, you're welcome to be here anytime, goes back to the men and says, drop a little bit more grain for Ruth. And eventually he says, hey, why don't you come and eat with me? And he sends her home with over 30 pounds of grain. Naomi, seeing that this is a pretty good haul, says to Ruth, where did you go? And she says, well, I went to the field of a man named Boaz. And she says, that is a family member to Elimelech. And this is where the plot thickens. Because if he's a family member, then he can be a redeemer, which is a legal term for someone who fulfills what is owed to a family. It's similar to the Leverett marriage we talked about a few weeks ago, where if a bro uh, someone died and left a widow, the brother would marry the widow so that she could have a boy, so she could have an heir, she could have a child. And this is what's beginning to happen, is there's some connection to the family. And so Naomi has an idea, and this is what she says to Ruth in the third act, chapter three. It says, one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose woman you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes, and then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits. Literally means in the Hebrew, he was punchy. He went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Now, no one really can agree on what's happening here on the threshing floor. There's a lot of people who suggest, 
scholarly folks that uncovering the feet and spreading the garment are a euphemism. Now, if you're here and you're young and you don't know what a euphemism is or what that could possibly be referring to, ask your parents on the way home. They will love to explain exactly what I'm talking about. What most people agree on is that this is some sort of proposal, this is some sort of marriage, that Ruth is actually the one proposing the marriage to Boaz. That she and Naomi have figured out that if he is a redeemer, then if she proposes marriage, she might actually move him to the point where he accepts her proposal and now Ruth can have a child. And so this is what Ruth does. And the, the term spread your garment over me is actually one that is used frequently as this idea of marriage. When Boaz hears this and sees this and experiences this, he says to her, what you have done is good. You've not gone after a younger man. You've, you've come to me, which is the right thing to do. And because of that, I will in the morning have a conversation because there's another person before me who has rights to step in as the redeemer before me. So he tells Ruth to leave. He sends her home with some more food. And the next day, we read in Act 4 that Boaz does, in fact, go to the city gate, which is basically the court of its day. And he brings the fellow in who is the redeemer before him. And the guy says, I have no interest. And in the presence of witnesses, Boaz says, well, then I will take Ruth as my wife. And this is what happens in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed, which means servant. He was the father of Jesse, the father of King David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez, who was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nishon. Nishon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of of David. This is where the story ends. And it's like the very final scene, all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is about David's family. Kind of a surprise ending. But here's what's interesting. This book is kind of wedged between, in our um, Bibles, between Judges and 1 Samuel. It's a really short story. It's only four chapters long. It's about two women. It's kind of a feel-good story. I mean, this is definitely one that you would see on Hallmark, where there'd be like an actor who kind of appears in everything. You never really know who they are, but they end up like on shows like Dancing with the Stars to make ends meet. That kind of movie. It's nice. Feels good. Kind of moves along. Has a little bit of intrigue. A little bit of a surprise ending. But here's what's interesting. Nobody knows or agrees on why Ruth is in the Bible. I mean, sure, there's the backstory to David, but we can get that through a genealogy, or we could have made the Ruth story more of like half a chapter in another book. And no one really agrees or even understands why it's in the Hebrew Scriptures. Both Jewish and Christian people have different ideas about it. More than that, nobody really knows what the point of the story is, what the meaning is, what the, what the whole book's about. And there are endless, there's endless scholarship and opinions and ideas and people who dissect individual Hebrew words in Ruth and still nobody agrees or can really figure out what the whole point is. But one of the things that's true is it seems like we can't get enough of the book of Ruth. Because the book of Ruth has been widely studied and told and retold. And many believe that it existed only in oral form for generations before it was finally written down. It's like whatever, whatever the reason is for it being in the Bible and whatever it means, it's been so compelling to us that we just can't stop talking about it. And I wonder, maybe it's not so much the book itself. Maybe it's because it's a really good story. And we as human beings are story-based creatures. 
We love good stories. And we tell stories. We tell stories because our life actually unfolds like a story. One of the common questions that we hear this time of year over and over and over is, what are you doing for the holidays? Or what are you doing for Christmas? Or what are your Christmas plans? And typically, if you ask somebody that question, a story will follow. They'll start talking about their family. And sometimes it's a good story. Other times it's, yeah, I'm going to see my family. And so politically, we disagree. And so we always have these conversations. And then you hear about what happened when somebody threw a wine glass at somebody else because they voted for the other candidate. And you're like, oh my goodness. You're like, yeah, it's that kind of thing. Or they'll tell a story about like their mom's ugly Christmas sweater. And what a joy it is every year when she comes down with a new one on. And I always like to say, ugly Christmas sweater's redundant, just so you know. As opposed to what, like a good-looking Christmas sweater? Just don't exist. Or I asked somebody recently, what are you doing for the holidays? And they told me this long story about how every year, by 7 p.m. on Christmas Day, their dad's gout flares up because he eats and drinks like crazy on Christmas Eve. And the whole night, his, mo- his wife's like, honey, you know the gout's going to come back. And he's like, it's worth it. Jesus is born. And like the next day, they're like, he's laid out. Like, the- we tell the stories. I mean, think about it. If you walked up to somebody and said, hey, how have you been? It's been a while. I haven't seen you. And they're like, I put gas in my car. I have a friend who ate a chicken salad sandwich with pickles. I think my shoes are tight. I love Pringles. You'd be like, this is weird. Now, all of those things could be true, but they're just these random facts and data floating out disconnected from things. It's weird because it's not a story. Research has actually shown that we, physiologically, we, are gra- we gravitate to and engage in stories. Rachel Gillette talks about that this happens because of the way our brains are wired. This is what she says. She says, when reading straight data, only the language part of our brains work to decode the meaning. But when we read a story, Not only do the language parts of our brain light up, but any other part of the brain that we would use if we were actually experiencing what we're reading about becomes activated as well. What this means is that it's far easier for us to remember stories than cold, hard facts because our brains make little distinction between an experience we are reading about and one that is actually happening. This is why you can watch a movie and you know it is fiction. It's not true. It is the manifestation of somebody's ideas and you watch these characters plod through this story and by the end of it, you're in tears. It's because your brain is saying, you're living this story. And all the parts of your brain that would light up if you were actually having the experience light up and you end up in tears. I've never heard anybody be like talking about equations and say, yeah, it just gets me every time. I know some of you are here, you're like, wait a second, buddy. I'm pretty passionate about equations. Okay, I get it, but it doesn't do the same thing to us. One of the things I think is interesting about this is how many times I see people, I see us, I see myself, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to a book like Ruth, we approach it like data. Just these like cold, hard facts. Or you have people who will say things like, you know, the the, the Bible is God's rule book, as though it's just like a bunch of statements that are listed, and these are all of the things that you're supposed to do. Or my favorite, when someone says, Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. (laughs) Oh, that's the worst. I'm never going to say that again publicly. But sometimes we approach the Bible as though it's just data. And as though it's like we're somehow distant and removed from our own lives. I think we approach our faith like that too. I mean, so many people when it comes to their faith or being a Christian or whatever label you have uh, gravitated toward or accepted for yourself or proclaimed for yourself. So often it's just statements of belief and it's propositions and it's ideas Maybe one of the reasons we feel so disconnected from our faith so many times is because we live and move in a larger story, and yet the faith is like over here, and it's just bullet points. 
And while they may be true, we're always trying to figure out how does it work? What does it mean for me in my everyday life? What does the data say to my story in a way that is shaping it? Because somehow it doesn't really register with us. For, see, for the ancient people, stories were everything. For our ancestors, they lived and breathed stories nonstop. And they were stories that were told to one generation and retold. That many villages and many tribes had storytellers who were responsible to pass on the stories of the past to those who were living there. And they did this because they began to realize there's something bigger at work here. It's not just us. Whatever is going on here, there's more than meets the eye. There's more than we can see. And they did this because ancient people, they lived largely in agrarian societies. And so they began to recognize that there was a specific time of year that if you planted seeds, those seeds would grow compared to planting them at other times. They also understood that when you planted this seed, it somehow disappeared, and yet this thing grew out of the ground, and this thing that grew out of the ground was connected to the sun and to the rain. And if you had too much rain or too little rain, it didn't grow, and if you had too much sun or too little sun, it didn't grow. And every day, they would watch the sun rise on one side of the sky and go to the other. They would see the rain fall. They couldn't control it. And they began to say, I think there's something or someone or a series of someones that are responsible for all of this. And they began to tell stories. Now, in our world today, we're like, oh, yeah, the sun and the rain and the dirt. I get it. You're talking about the water cycle. Or you're talking about La Nina or El Nino. Which, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that means the Nina and the Nino. <laughs> or it's climate change or whatever. Like, we have the answers. We have the data. We sure do. But isn't it interesting how we live in a world where people are still very, very, very hungry for meaning? Stories offer these kind of meanings. Data doesn't always do that. Like, we have 10,000 songs in our pocket. We have Google on our iPhones. Great. When was the last time you stood in awe and wonder when you were detached from the electronic leash? Maybe the reason we love the book of Ruth is because Ruth is a story. And it's a story that is filled with meaning that's swimming just below the surface. From the opening words. The opening words of Ruth are, in the time of the judges... Now, the judges refers there in this context to a period of time in the history of Israel when they had no king, and the book of Judges is about this time. And it was absolute, utter chaos. It was violent. There were wars. There were people killing each other. It was riddled with scandal. There were murders. There was deception. It was the most horrific period of Israel's history that was just non-stop. And every once in a while, things would get so bad, and the people would cry out to God, and God would send them a leader or send them a judge, and they would sort things out, and life would be okay for a bit, and then it would just get bad again. The book of Judges ends with these words. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. That summarizes the book of Judges. And Ruth begins with, in the time of the judges. And what's fascinating is, in the time of the judges, you have these cycles of things going well, and then the things burn, crashing and burning, and people crying out. And God continues, out of God's goodness and faithfulness, to respond and send a leader who can straighten things out. In the time of the judges, there is a family in Bethlehem who has no food. And we see throughout this story over and over and over a word that's used to describe Ruth's and Naomi's relationship. And the word is hesed, which is this idea of like loving kindness, faithfulness, fidelity, this bonding to somebody. But in the time of the judges, it's like God isn't gone. Love is still flowing between people and families and good things are still happening. In the time of the judges, all is not lost. This is how the story begins. 
Rivka Kluger, uh, she's a Jewish scholar. She talks about one of the really interesting parallels in the book of Ruth. And the, one of the parallels is the pagan stories about the goddesses and their connection to the seasons. The book of, uh, as, or the book of Ruth begins with harvest. Or I'm sorry, it begins with famine and it ends with harvest. The entire love story between Boaz and Ruth is right around the harvest season. And the ancient stories told all over the ancient Near Eastern world about the goddesses, many of them were connected to the seasons, to the cycles of of, uh, the agrarian society, connected to the growth and the harvest of the seeds. And one of the more popular stories that was told about the goddesses was about a goddess who left her home went into the realm of death and then left the realm of death and went back to her home and with the help of the gods reestablished her life. In the book of Ruth, we have a woman named Naomi who goes from her home into the realm of death where her husbands and sons die and she returns home and with the help of the gods, she is given new life and has a son as we see at the very end. And Rivka Kluger points at this and she says, there is clear parallels here of telling a story about humans that was only a story reserved for the gods. Then there's the pivotal moment in the book of Ruth about the threshing floor. This is when Ruth uncovers his feet and says, spread your garment over me. The threshing floors were sacred places. The threshing floors were often centers of ritual and festivals because harvest was a way of showing your gratitude to the gods for everything that they had given you. Some say that the threshing floor is actually a sacred place because it is a very thin space between life and death, between heaven and earth. And there were all kinds of stories that were told in Ruth's day about how the gods brought to the threshing floor new life and a renewal. And so when you have those little details in there like, well, there was a threshing floor, it's like the ancient authors like nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you get it? Do you realize how important this move by Ruth is? This is about life and death. This is about heaven and earth. This is about the gods bringing renewal. If this doesn't work out, there's no King David. The threshing floor isn't just a side detail. The threshing floor is this central place where the pivotal scene occurs, where once again, when life and death hang in the balance, the gods show up and bring life. One of the interesting details about Ruth is God. God is silent. Throughout the entire book, God says nothing. God doesn't even seem to be observing. But some have pointed out that actually the writer of Ruth did this intentionally. Because when you consider Ruth and all that is there in the book and the parallels and the hints and the images and the metaphors, it's as though Ruth and Naomi are bumping up against the divine the entire time. That there's this story, this arc, that was one that was only ever told about the gods and goddesses. And now you see two women living out that same story as though the story of the gods and the goddesses is their very own story. And they say, God's not silent. God is speaking and living and moving in the lives of Naomi and in the lives of Ruth and in the life of Boaz. And then the story ends with Ruth and the writer pointing to King David, saying, you see where this whole thing is going? Do you see the importance of all of this? Matthew then says, no, this story doesn't just point to King David. This story points to Jesus. And when I consider why would Matthew have put this woman in the genealogy, I wonder, is it because Matthew understood, as many people in the ancient context did, that this story had something to do with humanity's engagement with and work with alongside the gods? Did Matthew understand that what this story is telling us is that, no, what Ruth did mattered, not just for her moment, not just for her mother-in-law, it mattered because there was a promise that was given to King David, and Ruth, without even really fully understanding who her great-grandchild would be, she was the one who made the decisions, and she was the one who showed the courage, she's the one who showed the fidelity that brought forth King David, and King David and his throne 
God told him, would never depart from the house of Israel. That somehow Ruth, she played the part, Ruth played the part of a human being who was acting in concert with the gods. And I look at that and it points to Jesus and I think, well, this is kind of the story of Advent. I mean, it begins with an angel showing up and speaking to Mary and saying, hey, we need you. We can't just do this. We're not just going to like beam Jesus down there and have him pop up as a grown man with no belly button. It would just be weird for everybody. We need you to participate with us. And then we see the birth narrative. That there's a child that's born. Why are we drawn to the scene? Why do we put up nativity scenes everywhere, all over the place? I mean, big kids are born every day. And I get it. Some of you are here, you're like, oh, but my, the story of my baby was miraculous. They're all miraculous. And it's probably more miraculous for you. But I mean, they're born every day. So why are we always telling the story about the child being born? Because God putting on flesh. It's God saying to us, hey, part of being human is participating with me. And I want to show you what it looks like to live a full human life. So rather than just dictate it, I'm going to live among you and with you. And so when we come to the nativity, when we come to the birth of Jesus, there's something in us that goes, this means something. There's something here that goes deeper than just another story of another baby being born. And we're drawn into this story. Because it's God in skin and bone. And maybe one of the reasons that speaks to us so deeply is because of how the Bible speaks about who we are, that we are God in skin and bone. The biblical writers say that you are the body of Christ. That somehow we are those who are a part of a story that's far bigger than ours, just like Ruth and Naomi were. That we live each and every day bumping into mystery. That our story is one of an invitation to participate with God. That just as the story or the book of Ruth is a story and the gospels themselves are a story, we are living a story. And the question becomes what kind of story are we living? Maybe one of the questions we should begin considering is what, what does my story say about what I believe about the world? So many people that I talk to, when it comes to their faith or when it comes to their life or whatever it is, there's just kind of this directionlessness. Yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know what makes sense. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know how any of this will work. Well, if the story of Ruth teaches us anything, it means that, it teaches us that everything you do matters. That whatever you do with your life, it's going to do something to either move the story forward or pretend like the story doesn't exist. What would it mean to you to leave this morning knowing that everything you do matters? That God invites us, and I would say suggest God needs us to participate in God's story to move the whole thing forward. Just like Ruth and Naomi and their fidelity was needed and their courage was needed, so you are needed. One of my favorite little proverbs goes like this. Do not pray that God will feed the hungry family that lives down the street from you when you have a cupboard full of food. How many times do we sit back and go, oh, I just don't know, I don't know like, what can happen. Or, oh yeah, we're just sending you thoughts and prayers. No, Ruth tells us, no, do something. God invites you to do something because you are participants in a larger story. What would it do for you if you realized that every time you show kindness to a stranger, every time you give generously, every time you push through the, the hurt and the pain and the wounds in your old life, own life to pursue more healing so that you can be more of a healing presence, all of those things matter, not just for right here and now, but they matter in a much larger scale, in a much larger story. You see, if Ruth teaches us anything, it's that God needs us to participate with him. And maybe this is why we love Advent so much. Maybe this is why we love Christmas so much. Because there's something that we see in this story. People surrounding the Christ child, the shepherds, the wise men, Mary, Joseph, 
And something in us knows that they're participating in something bigger. Maybe that's why we're so drawn to it. Because we have to believe, we want to believe, we need to believe that there's something bigger going on here. This is what Ruth teaches us. This is what Jesus teaches us. And my prayer for all of us is that our lives and the stories that will be told about us will teach this to others. Let's pray together. God, we recognize that so often we're wondering what kind of world that we're living in. We're wondering what it is that we're bumping into. We're wondering if our lives have meaning, if what we do even matters. This is why we say thank you for this short story about two women whose faithfulness to each other, to you, their courage, their determination, continued the story that you wished to be told, not only through King David, but through Jesus. I ask as we spend time reflecting now that you would cause us to remember, that you would cause us to see that just like Ruth and just like Naomi, what we do matters. That just like our mothers and their courage and their good deeds, our good deeds can reshape and shape the world to come. Would you give us that insight? Would you cause us to see the meaning that's been given us so that more may know of the heart of God and the love of Jesus? We pray these things together in his strong name and all the people say.